Well, yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. So my name is Eileen Neuer and I'm on the board with Rancho Cordova Arts. Uh, we really value creating an inclusive environment for promoting the arts. Um, and this workshop is one of those ways that we try to uh, provide opportunities for professional development for artists. Um, so, and if you're interested in more workshops, we have a library on our website on rancherquitoverarts.com. And um, there's all different instructional videos, including one of a previous um, workshop that Leanne, that Leanne hosted, and I absolutely loved it. So yeah, if you have, um, if you watch this and you love it, there's plenty more videos to enjoy. Leanne is just the most wonderful artist and a really lovely person. And I'm so stoked that she was happy to um, facilitate this workshop. She, I was immediately drawn to her work. She's just, um, her work is so vibrant and energizing. And I think that's unusual to see uh, in art because often people feel intimidated in, and instead she just goes right for it. So if that's going to be like a metaphor for life, then I think that's like the best because if you want to just dive right in, then Leanne is your person. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over. Oh, we have one person joining us. I'm going to pass it, pass this over now to you, Leanne. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Eileen. That was really nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so today we're doing uh, the color theory, which is like one of my most favorite topics. And last time we did values. And um, this kind of just leads on from there. So if you like what you're hearing here, maybe you want to go back and have a look. But um, I think we did lemons during the um, value um, topic. And I have an example here, I think, yeah, here's one. And I think we probably painted, we probably painted that, um, if that's on my other screen. And um, the thing with the process there, if I just want to recap, is like, I would uh, draw, I don't know whether to put it on the big screen or I think I'll put it over here. I would do, this is persimmons, and I would just do a little value sketch like that and have like the dark and the cool areas. And those dark and cool areas um, would translate to cool and warm areas, basically. Because when if you take your subject and you put it in the sun, the, the light is going to be warm and the shadow is going to be cool. But if you're doing like a, a nude or a person, you know, like inside at night, often the colors will be uh, reversed and they'll have cool light shining on them. Like I know a lot of figure studies it works out being the opposite. I don't know why I thought of nude, but you know, like figure studies um, they'll have cool light and then they'll have uh, warm shadows. And you'll see that sometimes in some portraits, they'll be cool on the warm side and then on the, on the sunny, the light side and um, warm on the shadowed side. Okay, so it can reverse. So, but you can't have warm on both. So if you're sitting painting a couple of apples that are sitting in the sun and most of my apples I take the bowl and I put it outside and I take a photograph of it. Um, so that's just how I get that. Then I can see the values really clearly here. You see, there's the line, there is the line, there is the line. And I'll paint this for you and you'll see this happening. But there is a, a cool and a warm. So you can definitely see that the light green is the warm light and it's not reversed. So sunlight is always warm. Um, and so basically the way I do my palette is based, leads on from that value understanding of summarizing it to two values and then just tweaking in an extra one, extra one like the highlight or an extra dark area somewhere, okay? So for my demo, I'm going to do um, these apples. That's why I had them up. And we're first going to conquer our palette, okay? So I don't know if you can, Eileen, can you um, spotlight my palette so that everyone can see exactly what I'm doing on here? Or do yep. I need to do that? Uh, one moment, hang on. This is like the shortcut where you don't have this, if you use this palette, you won't have the problem that somebody mentioned of like harmonizing your colors. They will naturally harmonize because they can't not harmonize. 
um, because you've limited your palate. So this is a very um, extreme, not extreme, but it's, um, this is very workable. I can paint anything with this palette, absolutely anything, okay? So, but it is a limited palette and it's limited to primary colors. So I have red, yellow, blue. And then here to make a chromatic black, I have the French ultramarine blue and um, burnt sienna. So that is the, the only color that is not a primary, but I need that in order to make my chromatic black. You never put tube black on here because then everything will go gray and smudgy and look awful. Unless you're doing something that is um, a little abstract or a little, you know, you want to do lettering on your building or, you know, something else. But if you're actually trying to make uh, something look realistic, you use a chromatic black. So I'll show you the key to this process is with the reds. Okay, so you can see the reds are different. One is cool and one is warm. This is alizarin and this is a cad red medium. I could also use cad red dark. So this is almost orange, but it's very cool, very warm. In my two yellows, I have a warm and a cool. This is lemon yellow and cad red light. Then my blues, I have French ultramarine is a perfect cold blue, but you can also use phthalo blue. Um, and then this is cobalt, uh, yeah, cobalt teal. I've recently, no, this, this is cobalt teal, this is my favorite. You can see the tube is over, but um, I've used a cerulean blue, which is also quite warm. So it doesn't matter, you don't have to follow these exact colors that I've got on here, but you, it's good to have a cool and a warm, because when you're, say you're painting something that's blue, you want to be able to paint the, work the cold blue in the shadow areas and the, the warmer blue in the light areas. But now the key to all of this is to making a chromatic dark. So here you just use kind of equal amounts of the French ultramarine. And this is a tip you're going to just want to keep. And the burnt sienna. And this can tweak a little more. Make sure you get it in the neutral range. So it's not blue or it's not brown. But if you add some white to that, you can get your middle value. And that's when I'm really seeing if I got a right or not, you know, if I got a gray. So there I did, I got a gray, but it's a chromatic gray. So it's not gonna make anything muddy. And then I take a little bit more of that and a lot more white. And bam, I have three values. Okay, I've got some brown there. Okay, and of course I have white can be my last value. But there you can see my darkest, middle, and light. And any of these colors that I want to um, say, I have a blue something or other, and I want to make the shadow part, I will take that dark in there, which is now blue and brown. And that is a very nice dark blue. It almost looks black there, but if you paint it on the object, you'll see there's more blue. And there's that light blue again. I'm just spreading it out so that you can see it. And these, putting these grays in knocks down the uh, intensity of these colors. I don't always knock them down as uh, Eileen was saying, <laughs> I do go full on. So often I just use these colors at full uh, chromatic intensity. So you can see this is really bright. I love that, I love that. But if you wanna be more natural, you can definitely knock it down. So I wanna clean that. Okay, so now that doesn't, that is not how you paint something blue, like that light color is going to be the highlight, it's not going to be, it's not going to be this color, this is warm, so now you'd be adding in your yellows in there. So there's two ways to make, change the value on something, is to be adding white or the, your, um, your chromatic black to knock it down a bit, but you don't, if you're painting a red apple, for example, you don't want to be going red apple, and white, you can have a pink apple. So then you wanna be using this to be the lighter portion, the sun-drenched portion of your um, apple. And you wanna bring in yellow to knock it down, uh, to highlight it further. 
that looks too orange. But for uh, the highlighty part of a red apple, that would be the light warm side of it. So here's my my red apple, and where the sun would be hitting it, it would be more, you're producing more yellow for warmth. Of course, I can't with a blue ocean, if I'm painting a blue ocean, go and start adding yellow, I'm gonna have a green ocean, <laughs> which is fine for like chromatic subtleties here and there to have flashes of green, but you're gonna be wanting a, you, a lot of the knocking down process here, and also moving from cool to warm to get to a different value within your, within your blue. So yeah, and then everything else, obviously, like you don't want to be mixing green from a tube. The greens are horrifying, okay? They don't look anything like green. Here, you, with these two blues and these two yellows, you can get a whole range of very bright, and this is green is the scariest color on the entire pal palette. Um, so here's a very, very warm, sun-drenched green, but you might want to just knock down that some a little bit. Ever so slightly, make it more manageable. Then you might want to notice I'm not cleaning my palette knife too much. Whoa, super green. Like you only, that kind of green is eye jarring. Actually that I can manage now that it's blended. So you've got to keep it in the, for green, obviously it's nature. You want it to keep it natural. Um, so you can only go so far with using the lemon yellow and then it won't lighten anymore. And that is when you are going to have to go a little minty, so to speak. Using, going to knock it down a bit here with that. It's not too minty because I use the gray, otherwise it would be mint, which is not a color that you find on a leaf. So there you get a whole range of different greens immediately and they're all quite natural. And all these colors harmonize because they'd be knocked down with this chromatic black. Occasionally you can use some white, but you're limiting this palette. So everything is gonna harmonize. Um, don't use purple so much, but I can, Mix up some purple here. Oh, and the other thing is I keep my palette in this specific layout so that it's easy for me. And I normally keep my, my, gray, my darks a little closer to the edge here, but I have cool colors and warm. I mean, from a color point of view. And then within each one, there is a cool and a warm, uh, yeah, cool and a warm, a cooler and a warmer. So it's strange for people to understand that there is a cool red but there is such a thing. Let's see if we got some purple there. Yeah, we did, purple. And of course, if that's too vibrant and you want something more natural looking, you just knock it down. Because not everything is full intensity. Okay, so that's the basics of, um, I had my back to you guys the whole time. <laughs> but that's the basics of color theory. So I've just mixed it up there for you. And you should really go and, and try this process like um, for yourself. So you get so, some sort of comfort level with the color mixing process. But you can see all those shades, I can mix pretty much any shade I want of anything. And mixing it from your primaries like that, and also just having two primaries gives you far more range um, in, in the colors that you can mix and also in your ability to do the warm and the light with your value, um, with, you know, when you're painting something with values, which everything has values. And I just wanted to say um, the process to learning how to paint um, and control your colors is just to repeat the same thing over and over and over again. So what I have done is I have like, for example, these um, apples, I have painted them various forms of apples. Like you can see this one up here various um, configurations of the same thing, maybe like eight times. And uh, up there on the top, I have some mini lemons. I'm gonna raise this up. I've done the lemons up on the very top there. I don't know, you can see five of them, maybe it's too small. But um, I have painted the lemons even more times on board, on little canvases, on everything. Every time it's slightly different, but it's the same process that I'm doing. So sometimes in my shadows, 
I want to um, play up, make it cooler, you know, more purple, more blue, any of those cool colors that I'm seeing at that particular time. And even though it's the same lemons over and over, you end up, uh, they end up coming out slightly different. And that is that that repetition is like key to learning this process and also finding your own voice. Like, how do you like to use your color palette? This is the generic baseline color palette. This is the key to like how to keep it harmonized, how to keep your colors pure, how to knock them down, how to change your value nicely so it doesn't look like you know start jarring. It's all part of the same thing. But how are you going to interpret that? That's just like the the basic things that are available to you, but everyone's going to interpret it like those lemons, everyone's going to interpret it differently. They're going to have their style or their way of, of pushing the shadows, because you don't have to paint completely realistically. Um, there has to be some expression in there, some of you. So your interpretation of the shadow, some people like cerulean blue shadows. And that's like, okay, you know, that's great. It's beautiful. That's your thing that you're doing and you're always doing that. Then, um, but it has to harmonize with the subject a little bit and when I do the demo I'll show you how to bring in the, the local color I'll talk about that as well okay but what I do and what's a great thing is you think all those canvases are expensive I'm going to have like a heap of canvases is to use like a canvas pad like this like a sketch pad and you just get one of these 10 or 20 sheets and you just knock out 10 or 20 color studies of the exact same thing you'll be a master of that by the end of this pad so one canvas pad and you're, you've conquered this whole entire process. I can't stress enough how easy this is. And all I do is I fold it back and it's already on a backing. You just put it on your easel and paint away and tear it off. So, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, but it's a piece of fabric. Like, how do I paint that? Just keep it on the pad until it's dry and then put it aside. So yeah, that's my biggest tip is just to repeat this and repeat this and repeat this. So I was talking about the Cerulean shadows. I don't know if you can see this, my um, persimmons that I did. These are all quick color studies. I do them in like 15 minutes or so. Um, and you can see I've pushed the Cerulean blue quite a lot. And that's just because of the orange, right? And I wanted that to, that was what I was trying to express, like that vibrancy. So I pushed the blue shadows a whole lot just to, and you can see my neutral, my chromatic black in the darkest part of the shadows. And that's just simple, it came straight off my palette. That's how I can do it in 15 minutes. All my colors are right there. So I just take the chromatic black, smear it on, and then it's like, oh, that's dead. And then I put in the um, cerulean blue just to bounce off that orange and give some vibrancy. And the same for the darkest part of the shadows. I'm gonna put it down here so I can point. Uh, the darkest part here, I just took that chromatic black and just warmed it up a little bit more with the brown, the burnt sienna. So I just took a smidgen quickly, so it was a little warmer. Here it's a little cooler, it's more on the blue side. There's more of the French ultramarine. That's just a smudge of difference. And then I have those dark values, and then I can put in my local color, and then the light. So here you can see I warmed it up with more yellow. And then in the leaves, um, you can see this here, particularly very uh, yellow green, and then it's a cold green in the, in the darker parts. So if you're just managing the temperature in a relative term, so obviously, um, say for example, orange is warm, but you can make it cooler and warmer in where the values change. And if you just manage the temperature locally, that just pushes, uh, the, it makes the values well, the values and the colors interplay and it just makes the thing quicker and easier to do and and look realistic and you can even get lots of things wrong but if you get those two things right like the values and the color roughly the whole thing just pulls together easily you can see i'm not a super realistic painter it's a there's a lot of expression there and you can do a lot more expression you know but if you just squint your eyes you can see the lighter part of the persimmon is more on the yellow side and the darker part of the persimmon is that chromatic black. And that chromatic black just translates into any subject here, even this green apple that I have up here. Um, if you just knock that down with your green. So I'm gonna actually mix that for you before I do the demo. So let's say I like this green. 
and I want it to be super dark. This is the absolute darkest part of my apple. There it is. And that didn't take me a second because I already have my, I'm sorry that I'm so messy, but I already had my um, chromatic black with the three values all lined up here. And so I could just super quick in one brush stroke make that dark. And I already have these three options for warm greens relative to this and blend that in super quick. So those are my tips. Now I'm going to uh, demo for you the um, painting of the green apples. So Eileen, if we could move back to my uh, room view because I want to use it from my laptop here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm wearing green in honor of these green apples. <laughs> so with the demo here, it's 15 minutes just so that you know. Um, and I'm going to explain to you, can you all see that? Okay, so there you can see I do a priming, I prime in a warm color, and of course I take that to pure bright red, but you can do something more natural, and um, some people use like an earthy, some sort of earthy brownie reds, a lot of landscapers use, um, I love the red, I just think it makes it pop. So there I'm putting in the um, basic drawing. And I just use a dirty with my chromatic black because it's not going to make everything muddy and I don't use charcoal because that is obviously a pitch black and um, it makes everything muddy so you'll drag that mud into your color and ruin it so if I just use that chromatic black I can't go wrong I can put it in anywhere so you can see I'm sketching super comfortably relaxed because I'm not worried about that paintbrush at all it's actually a blue and a brown so it's like so neutral but it comes across as a black black and when you uh, add white to it, it is um, it goes gray. It's like a pure gray. So you can push it on the warm or the cool side very easily. So yeah, here's the value part of the whole thing of the process. So the values tie in because you're doing the dark two values, just dark and light. And then that helps me do cool and warm. So when you're doing values, it's dark and light. When you're doing colors, it's cool and warm. And within that, you know, the cool and the warm, there's so much place to play. Like you could do any cold color, any warm color. You know, you can push those things and it'll still look, it'll look great. Um, and the same with the value. You can maybe keep the value. Um, what it should be, darker for a shadow, and then push the colors. Honestly, I feel that anybody can conquer, you know, basic color theory in like 10 little exercises. You just do the same thing 10 times. And that's all there is to it. So there's the darkest. And now you'll see I'll use the green with our pre-mixed green here with the chromatic black and make the very dark green. And you'll be surprised, it's just two greens and it'll come out. And the, of course the highlight of, you know, the white highlight afterwards is, um, makes it sort of, just completes it, it bulges it out. So you can see it's a very cold green. It's a very blue green. I pushed it out to be very blue green. <laughs> Leanne, I just wanted to say it's so funny, the angle. You've yeah. got the photo of the apples and then behind that is your painting of the apples. Yes. <laughs> it's apples everywhere. <laughs> Lovely. And well, now I guess it helps to see the finished thing, right? I've done it a number of times and like I really do do it the same thing over and over. It's always different and you, you never copy. You're just experiencing the same thing again. Like you're experiencing the cold, you're experiencing the warms, you're experiencing where the, where the light and the dark is, but it just comes out different depending on mood and the day and your color interpretation and stuff. And I think that is a process that we should go with, you know? And that is where expression is. Like some people want it to be like perfect color or whatever, whatever they understand to be the perfect thing. But the reason why it's not a photograph and why an artist is painting it is because 
there's a bit of you in that, you know, how you're feeling that day. But yeah, you can see I've found more of a, like a local lighter color within the dark. And I'm just adding that in on top after I've blocked in the cold. So you always get reflected light um, inside your shadow. It's not one solid color. It is, there's going to be small smidgens of reflected light. And you just literally looking at, if you're working from a photograph, you're looking at that, if that says there's reflected light. You don't have to imagine it or anything. You can either play it in there or you can play it down. And you'll see I'll blend that in and those highlights don't stand out so jarring <laughs> in a little bit. Yeah, but it's nice also. I'm, the reason why I chose the bright red uh, priming is because I was going to work in green and using a complementary color like that does add vibrancy. If I was to use um, something neutral or just like a blue maybe it would just sink that it would just you like you're falling into a dark it's just too dark you know you don't get that that um, energetic tension from having the um, all the red there so you'll see we're already halfway done and in the next like three to four minutes this painting will be done look how warm that green is I've really pushed it I have pushed it to like a sunny yellow green, very light, using that lemon yellow and the lightest and warmest blue that I have on there. And uh, that, is, that is what you can actually see in those apples anyway. That is how it is. Some people try and paint the whole thing green and then they lighten it and darken it. You've actually got to use slightly, you've got completely different colors for the warm side and completely different colors for the dark side of your object, whatever it is. So I probably don't blend that right away, but when I do, that would be an apple. <laughs> I, um, I forgot to say earlier that if anyone has like comments or questions. Yeah, now is the time to ask. Yeah, or like at any time you can just unmute yourself and just be like, oh yeah. Far away. Far, yeah, so. Yeah, and I do also paint the white ball there in this, uh, in the next few minutes. Um, and that was so simple. Like people think, oh, white, how do I paint white? And the shadows are white. It's just the white with the chromatic black. So I already have it mixed out on my palette here for you, the dark, the medium, and the light. But of course I use a lot more of the pure white on the left-hand side of the ball and then just use a little bit more of the chromatic um, blacks, grays, chromatic black grays on the other side. And it's uh, when it's done like this, it is simple, it's quick. You can get the job done in a couple of minutes. Like this whole thing, will, the whole canvas will be done in 15 minutes and we're already 10 minutes in. So um, yeah, and that, that translates to anything. So obviously a more complex, uh, if you do apples say 10 times and lemons 10 times, You'll, and something red, then you have covered a whole bunch of different colors that you can manage from cool to warm and those values. And then when you paint like a portrait, you really have that understanding of all those basic colors and how to push them from warm to light, from warm to cool. So yeah, I wish it was more complex, but it isn't. <laughs> It's Michelle, as people think. Michelle had a question. She was asking, are you working in oils? Yes, yes. Sorry, this is oils, definitely. So I have a big old um, cart here of tons of tubes of oils. And um, yeah, I, I can't do this in acrylic at this point. I think it just dries too quickly, even in the 15 minutes. I think you can if you just do one apple at a time. Um, but it's the same process. Just being able to blend a few minutes later really helps me. Have you ever tried um, the slow, um, you know, there's the slow drying acrylics? Oh, you do, do you get, you get that? Um, I mean, I've never tried it actually, but I've heard about them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, there's no reason not. I mean, I've seen beautiful landscapes, all sorts of things in acrylic. I just personally have a better understanding of the colors in oil. Like I know exactly what French ultramarine can do because I have a limited palette. I've conquered those colors, you know. I, if I take out a different color, like for example, phthalo blue, oh my gosh, it can ruin my painting because 
I it does things to the other colors which I'm not expecting, you know. It's just very dark. And at certain times I need that. So I, I explained my limited color palette, but now and again, you have to, like for a specific thing, I was doing this large deep ocean thing. I need a phthalo blue towards the bottom to be even darker than French ultramarine. So then I had to go phthalo blue, but that was a whole learning thing for me. Um, and the other thing that I've really enjoyed is going even lighter with the blue. Um, the cobalt teal is, become my favorite. That's why that tube is so ruined, but um, that pushes it even lighter. So sometimes you experiment with an additional color in your palette, but this is my baseline palette that can pretty much do everything. If I'm doing something um, something else and I want to add one another color in temporarily, it's within a controlled environment. So I can, it makes, it works better than if I have like a little bit of pink and a little bit of special yellows and iridescent whites and all sorts of different things and I don't know how they interact, that's, not, that's going to come through as very incoherent. So you really do need to master, first of all, your limited color palette. And then when you occasionally add a little bit of another color from time to time, that's manageable. But yeah, there you can see my warm, I've literally just blocked in, the drawing was not important. I've just blocked in the warm and the cool and get the values in. And there you have three, four apples that appear three-dimensional more or less, I think. But yeah, within the shadow area, so shadows are hugely um, important. You can't make them be like flat, like just one color. You've got to find, once you've blocked in your two values and you're cool and you're warm, then you want to go into that cold green and see where there's a little bit of reflected light from the nearby apples. And so I put in those lighter areas and that helps to make the shadows feel three-dimensional. And it's only just an indication of light here and there. You don't need to go crazy. But if you do go crazy, it can look pretty realistic. Sometimes even when you do this in an abbreviated form, it can come be quite modern, you know, quite a modern look. So yeah, now the bowl comes in and literally I'm just using the chromatic black and grays and white. I think anybody can do this. I was taught this color palette thing about 20 years ago and I, no matter how much I hear from other people what colors they use or do or do or don't do, nothing for me has made, you know, made more sense than this particular color palette. And the control that you can have over, over things. So just blocking in that white and then you'll see then the bit of chromatic grays come in there. Um, and do you have a particular brand that of oil paints that you prefer or does it like does it matter um that is i think you buy whatever you feel comfortable with but definitely the gamblin is what i prefer but gamblin is you know can be really expensive and when i'm painting like a really big like six foot by like three foot thing um you know winsor and newton is great <laughs> it's all cheaper it doesn't have the same um, pigmentation but it's the same color so we do the same thing um but i just have to use maybe a little bit more not a whole time but just a little bit more so it doesn't really matter and people fuss over brushes and brands of paint and everything that's not what's important your ability to do the values just sketch in light and dark i think everyone can see that and then keeping it to warm and light and not confusing those two and you just keep them separate because you have a warm and a light of each primary on your palette so just keeping the warm and the and the dark separate um that's you know that's far more important than wooden paint with your finger or a kid's brush or you know on a canvas pad or whatever it'll come through great just those oh, two okay. things i think so yeah you can see there's just the grays and i'm just going to blend that bowl and um oh i i just noticed there's a question from susan yeah. um, she says do you use a medium um for here when i'm mixing it no if i'm going to use it the second day then um 
I do use a lavender spark oil instead of turpentine, and I do use a smidgen of safflower oil. So let me show you the sap. I don't know which the safflower oil is a Gamblin brand. So I don't know if you can see that up there. I'll show you again later. And so is the lavender spark oil. Which is a, like a turpentine, but it's a turpentine substitute. So I don't use anything else. There's any oil in a painting has to be used very, very liberally. I just use it actually, I pour it on my, my actual palette, put a drop on each color to help it stay soft for the next day. And then of course I can mix that in uh, the next day and it's totally fine, but I can't add a puddle in there. Otherwise the painting never tries. So you just need to be very frugal with the oil because it doesn't evaporate as much as you know, the turpentine type things. So yeah, the white bowl has just been blended and I've just added a little accentuated that highlight across the right hand side of it. And that's it. Um, I have a question that's a bit besides, it's not exactly about painting, but how do you take care of your brushes after you've painted? I'm, I'm pretty lazy. I, I'm really terrible and I destroy my brushes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a jar of uh, the lavender spike oil because I'm trying to be healthier, you know. Um, and the lavender spike oil is quite expensive, like $60 for a bowl. So, I mean, tips, the odorless tips is great. Um, but I just really do a good job of cleaning that up and drying it in the tips and then I leave it and go. And after a couple of weeks, I might find if they dry and I find I can't bend them. Even if I soak them for them, I can't bend them, then I do wash them. I have like um, a big jar of uh, oil brush cleaner and I just leave them in a glass jar for a day or so and then they're soft again and I wash them up with soap and water and go. Every day, I can't do that whole cleaning thing. I just do a little bit of turps and wipe them, wipe them. All right. And if I haven't done a very good job, what I do is I take my glove off and I stick them inside the glove so they stay moist. Those are all my sleepy tricks. Because if you keep it covered and it doesn't dry, it's not going to ruin the brush. In fact, it's very hard to ruin an oil painting brush. But acrylic, it's super easy. Five minutes and it's ruined. But an oil painting brush, it's not, it's not that hard to ruin it. I mean, it's not that easy to ruin it. So you can see there, I've just added, a, so your brushes last for like ever, years and years. I've just added in a little bit of that white highlight, and then I'm, now I'm just tweaking. For the next while, I'm just tweaking little bits, adding a little bit of light here, a little there. It's just, that takes longer than the actual painting, but where we're at now, I would say it's pretty much done. You won't see much difference between now and 10 minutes later, <laughs> truth be told. So yeah, do you have any questions about color mixing? Well, Michelle had a really lovely comment. Uh -huh. she did this is a truly amazing demonstration. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I have to agree, um, especially with the palette explanation because um, I've been trying to be organized with how I do my palette and then yeah. I end up going and it just goes every. <laughs> Like the colors become confusing because I'm, I haven't kept it to a system. Yes. And so you that- You kind of need to know where to go. It's like driving and you know where all the controls are. So having the palette and some, you can see I'm not super organized on my palette. Like when I'm mixing, it goes wherever, but the source of the pure colors all along the edge, you know, the warm and the cool. And I put the white at the bottom and the gray down the side. So all the sides are taken care of. And then in the middle, yeah, I'm mixing, you know? And sometimes one color just, I need more of that and it all comes in together and that's fine because I've kept my colors pure, so to speak. Um, and they're the cool and the warms. And uh, so long as you just have those divisions of the two values and then the two temperatures, I mean, the rest is super simple. <laughs> just falls into place, yeah. Michelle also wrote, I loved the palette and color theory explanation. It was fascinating and really informational, really helpful, exclamation point. Oh, good, good, I'm glad. This makes sense to me, you know, and I, I never know if other people are going to find the same uh, sense in it. And simplicity, like some people have like, oh, very specific colors that they have to have to, in order to do their color palette and 
complicated things and it's just a cool and a warm whatever you've got find your warmest red and your coolest red and use that and then over time maybe try alizarin alizarin is great as a cold red um and i can i don't i don't know if i gave you my um my particular palette if i wrote that down anywhere but i will do that just now if anyone wants it but um yeah and then you can play around like maybe you hate alizarin oh my gosh and then find something else that you do love but that same theory applies with the cool and the warm and then the two values and simplifying it to i know nothing is two values but you simplify it to two values you can always complicate it later you can see here for 10 more minutes i'm complicating this um but it's basically two values and so being able to get those two right um, is the key and the same with the color and temperature you can just separate the cool and the warm on a face on a body on a vase on an apple or anything a bird dove you have the shadow and you have the white dove uh, you're gonna have the cool and the warm and then the whole shape and the drawing just takes care of itself um michelle just wrote um i would love the list of specific colors you happen to use um, i was only able to get a few written down okay i can repeat it now while we wait so here the um the, the, on the reds we have alizarin red and cad red medium did i use cad red medium yeah cad red medium and then there is a cad cad medium and um lemon cad lemon then I used cobalt blue and French ultramarine blue. French ultramarine blue and burnt sienna for the, for the uh, chromatic black. To me, I think the chromatic black is the key to the whole thing because you never make muddy colors. And you're not making it dark by accident. Like, oh, a little bit of blue, a little bit of purple, a little bit of all these desperate attempts to make it dark. You just take your chromatic black and it's the same dark every time and it looks neutral and calm. You can always jazz it up. You can always like push it to one way or add a bit more of your local color. You can always jazz up that neutral, but you have something sensible and calm and correct to start with. So Susan wrote, um, thank you for sharing your tips on color, exclamation point. Okay. I have a question that's not necessarily about color. Okay. Um, do you have a strategy for, um, so I have a really bad habit of putting way too much paint on my paintbrush and then it's too thick on the canvas. And then um, if, if I'm wanting to blend, it just, it just muddies everything. Um, yeah. Because I'm just, I'm stuck with too much paint. <laughs> so yeah, so there's the there's value in color, but then there's also a couple of other rules, and that is working from um, thin to thick. So when you're working with your dark colors, you notice when I started my, my apples, I started with the dark shadowy area, and it was just very scratchy. You could even hear the paintbrush scratching, and it wasn't a bristle brush, it's a soft brush, but you're just kind of like digging it in there. So you're keeping the dark, which you're actually going to layer on quite a bit, very thin. So you go from thin to thick. So you work very thin. Use a little bit of turps, keep it thin, like a wash almost. Even if it drips, it's fine. Like keep it very thin and then slowly um, thicken it up as you can now layer that, because that'll dry pretty quick. And then as you're layering it on, it'll stick. Because if you have a lot of paint and then a lot more, it's like butter and you're just going to be digging up the old color every time you put a brush down. So you want to have the first layer, which is your dark, really just be super thin, almost transparent, you know? And then it get it thicker and thicker as you go along. And by the time you get to that white, you can notice I just softly put that white highlight on because it's on top of a whole lot of other paint. And I'm just like smushing on a layer on top of other layers. And that's a la prana when you're working wet into wet and getting the whole job done in 15 minutes. Um, so you need to learn to manage the thickness of your paint. Yeah, that's about it. And of course, the lighter colors, you need to stick it on like icing, you know, thicker. Yeah, and not always. Like you can see my bowl, it's a little translucent. You can see a bit of red coming through here and there. So, so Jamie it. just wrote, and anyone is welcome to unmute themselves if they just want to talk instead of type. Oh, yeah. Totally okay. Jamie, did you want to share what you were just wrote? Um, or I can read that out. My, I really enjoy these presentations a lot. They seem very foreign to me because 
My style is more abstract or contemporary. I use a lot of bright colors, um, but I really would like to experiment with these techniques um, and see what they can do in relation to what I'm already doing. Yeah, what I think you should do is just go get a, a canvas pad, you know, from Michael's or whatever. I've got um, it written down. <laughs> and just experiment. Like, it's, it's not a commitment when you've paid like 20 cents per sheet. <laughs> you know, it's not like, oh, my canvas and, you know, and take that canvas pad and get a bowl of apples or lemons or whatever, photograph it and just do it 10 times. One a day. It's 15 minutes. Do one a day. And by the end of the 10, you're going to be, oh my gosh, like a whole new understanding of some of the stuff has to be done to under, be understood. Like, right. And I'm very afraid of oils. Um, I've had ba bad experiences with them. I, I prefer water soluble paint. Do so, yeah. you know, I'm making the problem a little bit more for me because they do dry quickly. Does the water, maybe, yeah. But if you're working in 15 minutes, I, you know, probably that's not really a, a thing. I agree with you, Leanne. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and just practice. Like, so you find your own voice. Like, this is basic theory for everyone, but then you want to find your own voice, your own way of doing pools. Like, you prefer your pools to be a little bit more blue, or you prefer them to be more browny or whatever. But the same chromatic black is just a key. You can always push your chromatic black, but that is just a key to keeping it neutral and not muddy. Like, they're just sensible tips that translate. Um, into anybody's style. And I think those are the only market, you know, art things that should be taught because you want to find your own voice. Understood. Yeah. I think that the um, chromatic black is a wonderful, wonderful tip. And I really appreciate your expertise. Yeah, so that each time you're mixing a dog, it's not like a mystery. How am I going to make that dog? You know, how am I going to make that shadow? That shadow right. is a whole nightmare situation. And sometimes it looks like the shadow is another, sh another entity, you know, <laughs> like some other thing and not part of the apple or whatever. And that's because you haven't used that chromatic black. You can do that. It's just quick. Anyone can do it. I love it. Yeah, there we go. Something um, that, um, you know, with this whole idea of you saying do it 10 times, yes. one of the total added bonuses to doing that, uh, which, I mean, you might be aware of or, um, you know, this... If you're, if you're someone who's selling work, um, if you're doing a subject 10 times, you suddenly have a series. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. <laughs> people love series. People slightly different, yeah. Yeah, people love having a series of work. Yeah. Um, and then, it, yeah, so it's just um, a re really cool, um, you know, additional outcome that, com that can come from that, yeah. Even for yourself, if you do apples or lemons or whatever 10 times, you have a little thing that you can frame for your kitchen you know a whole bunch of them and they're all going to be slightly different and that quirkiness of them being slightly different is just fabulous yeah so i mean the exercises are you know in and of themselves like self gratifying but yeah the skills that you learn and the insights are just you cannot put into words what practical experience will give you and now you won't just be practicing randomly shooting off in the wrong direction. This is very specific um, suggestions that I've given. And if you do that, you're practicing straight towards where you want to be going. And how you interpret that, even if you are like a completely abstract, intuitive painter, all these concepts still um, can affect and infuse what you're doing. I sometimes take workshops on all sorts of strange other things, and then they can still infuse my practice, but nothing has ever moved me away from my color palette or the values because it, it just works and it's simple <laughs> and it's quick and it's not complicated. <laughs> yeah. It, okay. It's a wonderful discipline too. You know, I think about painting something 10 times and I'm going, oh my God, I'm not sure I really want to do that. Will it be a chore? but I can see where it can become an exciting discipline. It can, because you can make things up each day. It's like, hey, um, yesterday's shadows were a little light. Um, I think I want to experiment with a little bit more vibrancy, you know, like pure color in my shadows and only have the chromatic black right underneath the thing, you know? And how does that look? And, you know, you start pushing yourself to experiment and to play, to keep yourself engaged. 
And 15 minutes, anyone can do that for 15 minutes. And it's just a piece of paper. So it's, um, it's just, an, you can think of it as a warm up exercise, but actually by the time you get into it, it's like, I'm into this and you know, I wanna finish this properly. Oh my gosh, this is working well. Yeah. And so it's just, um, whoops. It's, a, it's something which I find I don't get bored of and I, I'm not one for too much discipline. Um, but it is because there's so much that comes out of it for me as an artist that I can use in other things. You know, playing with like, what color background do I want? Do I want that mushy brown background? Nope, I don't want that. What do I want that's on my palette? Well, I love this cad red medium, you know? And it, you start finding your own expression and um, way of seeing the world, which is important. And that only comes out of practice, practice, practice. But if you're always like painting a fish and then it's a bird and then it's an apple and it's a people, then you never, some of those things aren't transferable. I mean, not, you're always just, you're focusing on the subject the whole time. Whereas now, if you just paint the same thing 10 times, you're focusing on your process, your color theory, your about understanding of values, because you're really, the subject is the same. So you're focusing okay. on those elements of art and then that can infuse your style. You have more to, you find your voice quicker. If that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. perception of the whole process yes because it is a process and um and acknowledging that and, and your role in it there's something magical in there yeah yeah okay um so i'm trying to see if i have done everything that i was attempting to uh, explain to you guys the cat palette layout the wounds um yeah, I think I've covered everything that I was that I had written down that I wanted to share with you. Um, if you um, your screen is still sharing. Oh, oh so yeah, the link spotlight at a page. Yeah. Okay, that's there great. Go. Hello, everyone. So yeah, you can see my lemons up there. They're all the same lemons, but they're all different. Especially when they're close up, they're very different. And, <laughs> The same with the apples and the persimmons and the various things that will come out differently each time. Um, I was just thinking like in terms of, so a lot of um, artists experience block. It's not, a, this is not a color question, but sure. um, I like your attitude to art generally. Like, and so um, I was wondering if you want to talk more about it because um, I have a hard time with like, oh, well, I'm not in the zone. I'm not in the right headspace to do art. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's almost like you need all the stars to align in order to get that one painting done and then it doesn't turn out the way you want or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. What are your, what, do you have any particular tips that help you with um, just like going for it? And Yeah, um, there's two parts to being an artist. There's conquering a medium and style, like your ability to express yourself. So your, this is, if you're an art, a visual artist, like this is what you have to conquer, okay? So these, the, the color theory and doing these exercises and the value part takes care of that. So you can express anything you want to the way you want to, okay? But then there's a second part where it's like, what do you want to express? Like, is it balls of fruit? Is it your, something deep in your soul? Is it like landscape? Is it portraits and different moods of people? Is it, you know, what is it? Like there's so many different things like um, the people are trying to express. They're just trying to beautify something or they're trying to express some deep thing inside themselves. And that is a separate thing to what we're teaching here. That's not teachable. That I mean, it could be, but it's a completely different, um, like that source of exactly what you want to express. You know, um, that is where people stumble up. Like, what should I be painting? Like, I don't know, and what should I be painting? <laughs> and um, I get that from meditation. I just like, I sit and ask myself, so what do I want to paint today? Like I actually ask the question, what do I want to paint? And then I go through different, um, I go through some like picture websites online. Like I Google different topics. Like all of a sudden, I'm thinking about trees. I'm thinking about trees. And then I just look at different trees, get ideas, different, you know, ways and looks and feels of different trees. And then I go out and photograph my trees. Um, or I think, okay, I, I'm done with trees now. I want to do, I feel fish, you know, 
through my meditation, then I go and I think about fish, go to the, you know, the Coney Gardens and have a look at their fish and various things. But that's something that you have to be quiet and ask yourself the question. That's what I do. What do I want to paint? Maybe you don't hear a voice, like I don't hear a voice, but I just get drawn to look at certain images and then certain images resonate with me. And that's my new area that I go into just because they resonate. Like I'm just interested in them. And maybe I don't even know why. Like I have no idea why I'm interested in that. But I think fish are beautiful right now. I love the way they splash and everything. And then maybe like three years later, I look back and I go, oh, wow, that was that. You know, that's what that meant for me. <laughs> but it meant, it does, at the time, I'm not aware of it. But I'm just doing what I'm drawn to doing. But I think you have to access that sort of inner voice. Like, what do I want to paint? And why am I painting? Even if you don't hear an answer, just asking yourself that and then looking, you'll find you're looking in the right direction. And I think another thing is just starting, uh, take, taking a risk and putting a mark on a piece of paper exactly. That's and exactly. seeing where that takes you and where that takes you and where that takes you. And you let yourself get into the motion and emotion of what's there. That's right. It's a process. So you can ask yourself a question, but then let go of the answer and just start doing it. Start looking at images, starting getting involved in painting or starting if it's abstract or whatever. Start making marks on the paper and getting involved. For me, I have to dig up an image. So I start just browsing um, and I find the internet. I don't dig up images from the internet, but I get the inspiration from there because I'm thinking of what to do. And that's my process because I'm a little bit more realistic. But I am tending more towards abstract and whatnot. And then it would be a process of just starting, you know, getting involved. And somewhere along that way, something comes out of that. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. But I find it is important to actually ask. If I just like sit there, I don't know what to do, then that is what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. But if I say I do, I mean, I don't, I, rather I just ask the question, like, what should I be painting? And then that thing comes along the way, as opposed to stating to the universe, like, I don't know what to paint. Like, that's not a good thing to have come back. So if you don't know, you just ask the question, that's a better way of being in that black hole. And it's like, what should I paint? I'm asking, what should I paint? <laughs> and then you yourself will probably show you yourself what to paint shortly. <laughs> It'll come. Read. Yeah. That makes sense, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed hearing that because we all have a slightly different, you know, process for getting to that point of actually painting. And I just find it really refreshing to hear. Yeah. But it's also the, the process of stating something negative, like, I don't know what to paint. I'm blocked. Then you are blocked because you've said you're blocked. Like, that's period. You just put a period after that. That's the fact. But if you say, I don't what should I paint, there's nothing negative in there, um, then you will answer that question at some point. Well, the other thing that worked for me is that I painted my block. There you go. <laughs> Just work through it. Exactly. Yeah. That was very cathartic. Yeah. And just getting, and if you really don't know and you can't, you, nothing's coming to you, then do a whole series of like those lemons up there or apples, whatever. And somewhere along the line, that forms its own energy. And then you go down that energetic pathway, like fruit, and then it turns into something else fruity, you know? Or, or fish. Fish, and then it's fishy. And then, yeah. <laughs> I love fish. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. They're just, they're lovely. And doves or whatever, just whatever interests you. And then you will find the meaning and expression of that later. Like you don't have to know now, oh, this means this to me. And I'm going to write up my artist bio and it's going to mean all this. Like it's, it's the other way around. You do it and then you find the meaning like later. You know, like, oh, that's what that meant to me. That's why I did it. But at the time, you don't know. You're just exploring color, value, emotion, whatever. Does anyone have any questions or comments about their process or, um, or questions about color theory generally? No, I just feel like I, I need to get up and start doing things. Oh, great. <laughs> yes, you do. It's so simple and you just got to make it your own. You know, the, doing the color palette like that every single time. So these are warms and these are cools. 
um, and just keeping it to primaries, you can't go wrong, but two of each so you can get more out of it. And also you can manage the warm and the cool side of everything. Um, it just makes everything simple and easy. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And everything else can be complicated in the universe, but this thing is simple. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, if no one has any other questions, we can we can finish this up. Um, so if you speak now or otherwise, <laughs> you can always email. You can always email um, me or Leanne um, if you have questions later on. And we will be posting this video on our website. Um, so maybe in the next two weeks, it'll be up there. Um, so thank you so much. Leanne for hosting and telling us about your like your all your insights when it comes to color theory and just general art practice yeah uh, I hope not. Susan just wrote thanks mm -hmm. um, and also Michelle just wrote oh let me see Hang on. oh that's very kind of you Michelle just wrote wow this is so helpful I am super inspired to get out there and paint <laughs> <laughs> very yeah. inspired you guys it's so heartwarming that's just awesome I feel the same way actually that's I'm like exactly ah, where I'm really going with this. um so yeah thank you for joining us today um everybody and you know it's just been such a pleasure to be able to make make this happen I'm so so stoked that um I met you Leanne and that you're able to do this oh, you're and, <laughs> So thank you for every um, for yeah doing. Eileen, this. thank you too because yeah. it's been so professional and so easy to watch, and I think that's your expertise coming through too. I appreciate it. All right, well everybody enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye. <laughs>